willkommen zum Filmgespräch zu In My Blood Runs beim Lukas Film Festival. Heute sind Nico und Sean bei uns im Studio. Ich bin Johanna und wir haben auch ein paar Gäste eingeladen. Wie immer findet das Filmgespräch nicht im Kino statt, sondern hier im Mock in Offenbach. An dieser Stelle nochmal danke dafür, dass wir die Räume nutzen können. Zugeschaltet über Zoom haben wir Maya Newell, sie ist die Regisseurin des Films, ähm, Rachel Edwardson, First Nation Producer und, aus, also, und außerdem William Tillmouth, der die Dreharbeiten als Filmadvisor begleitet hat. Er ist auch der Vorsitzende der Organisation Children's Ground, die sich für das Recht auf Selbstbestimmung von Aboriginals einsetzt und für deren Gleichberechtigung. Herzlich willkommen bei Lukas. Hi and welcome to Lucas at you. It's really nice to have you here. And before we start our interview, I would like to ask you if there is anything that you would like to say to our audience. Uh, firstly, I'd like to uh, thank you for the invitation. I think it's uh, great that I can uh, go all around the world without leaving my lounge. Um, I'd like to also pay my respects to uh, my elders. Um, for past, present and future. Um, I, I live in Alice Springs, which is the traditional name is called Mbantua. Uh, it's the home of the Central Arunda people of Central Australia. Um, thank you. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation where I am situated on right now, which is also known as Sydney in New South Wales in, in Australia, and pay respects to my elders past, present and emerging, um, and also welcome any other First Nations people who are joining us on this Zoom call today. Thanks. I'd also like to say hello. Thanks for having us. We're excited to be talking to you today. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the unceded territory of the Wurundjeri people, the Kulin Nations, also known as Melbourne, um, and then my own ancestors and um, lands I come from, the Inupiaq country in, in northern Alaska, um, and to the all of the elders um, past and present and the emerging leaders coming through that I've been so privileged to learn from and take a moment to recognize everybody's ancestors and what we all bring into the room and the strength that has brought you all here today. Thank you. Okay, I will now um, give the word to Nika and Sean and you can start asking your questions. Hi, yes, um, maybe just um, start about um, talking how this uh, collaboration um, started and um, how uh, you met maybe and how this, how this project, um, yes, yeah, came to fruition. I'll jump in. Um, so yeah, I'm Maya and I think, you know, this project started a long time ago, really. Uh, we were actually filming for about, you know, three years, but um, it sits on the bed of about a decade of relationships for me with Arunda Mob in the Desert in Alice Springs. I was very thankful to be invited and have the privilege to be invited um, by um, Jane Badavalu, who's one of our advisors, who's not on the call today, but also Arunda elders to make films alongside them as they were um, educating kids in language, in culture and identity. Um, the film also sits on the bed of, you know, relationships with our partner organisation, Children's Ground and Aquila and the trust that they um, had built because, uh, being driven by their families and Dwan's family in the film. Um, but I think, you know, over those years of working with families, it felt like we were making, we were making short films which are, were for educational purposes, um, just for... Um, yeah, just four families. And it felt like we were telling the same story over and over again, which was the kind of education systems that aren't seen and aren't heard and aren't valued in Australia. You know, it's a United Nations Declaration of Indigenous Rights that they have um, the right to education in their own language and through their own culture. And we don't offer that to uh, our First Nations children in Australia. So you have these kids that are, you know, fluent in their first language who confident out on their country and grounded in their identity and they go into the mainstream education system and and feel like failures at school um, so it kind of started there 
Um, but then I met Duan when he was um, about eight or nine and he just bounded up and was enthusiastic and um, just gorgeous and very articulate about his Nangra, which if you've watched the film is his healing power and what he got from his great grandfather. And um, he really wanted a film made about him. And so we started the process of sitting with his family um, and just talking about all those hard questions that I think all documentary filmmakers should be asking all the time, which is, you know, are we the right people to make the film? How should we make this film? What is the, the process that would, um, um, I suppose, acknowledge the appropriation of First Nation stories over many, many years, um, well, over decades, and work out how to make this film in the most, the most ethical way that we could. And a lot of the leadership from that uh, process came from Rachel, who's on the call right now, and also William at that early stage, um, and Children's Ground, which is the organisation that, that William heads up, um, working out how to ask those, those hard questions. Uh, just that the process uh, uh, was about the family telling uh, their story and the difficulties that they face in, in, in Alice Springs and the difficulties they have in regards to the surveillance and the scrutiny that their children are under uh, in terms of um, detention centres, uh, ultimately at the end of the day, 100% of people in detention centres in the Northern Territory are First Nations people, kids, and, um, and how conscious they were and aware of uh, how, how close to the cliff that he was in terms of going to a detention centre. And they, the family told that story in the way they wanted to do it. And um, it was a credit to the uh, filmmakers to allow that to happen. You know, there's a lot of these issues that you see in the film are are big issues, the big issues that we face in society, the big issues that First Nations communities around the world have faced for a long time. And often we forget to talk to children. Often we forget to bring the child's voice into the conversation and the young person's voice and children at this age between, you know, as you becoming a young adult can, uh, can bring so much to the conversation of what these issues look like on the ground. And so for us um, being able to work with Duan and his family and the community and being able to follow their courage to tell this story was um, an incredible honor and was something that we could get behind and help to amplify those voices and bring that story to screen. Because I think if you've watched the film, hopefully it's held some meaning for you and you can see, you know, what the, the brilliance and the strength and the resilience of Duan and his family are and his community um, facing the kinds of things that they face every day in their lives. So I, I, that, that really gave birth to this project because when you turn on the television or when you read the newspapers, the stories you hear, and especially in this country and in colonized countries, and I'm sure, you know, in your country where you have marginalized communities, the stories you often hear about marginalized children and marginalized people are, are deficit stories, they're negative stories, they're how they're failing out of school, they're how they're being arrested and put into jail. And they're very, very rarely, if ever, stories of strength and stories of resilience and stories of the incredible empowerment that people have held facing great adversity. And so that was a driving force of this project was to bring that, was to bring that strand to screen um, to help encourage, encourage us to see the whole picture of where communities are coming from so that we can really bring about change. Um, Maya, you said that you met Juan when he was eight or nine. So before filming, you had more than a year to get to know him. Is that correct? And because it, the film really feels uh, the, the connection and also um, feels really intimate and he seems really relaxed having someone film him all the time, or probably not all the time, but a lot of the time. Yeah, I think um, it's a really good observation. Um, the film is incredibly intimate and there's a couple of 
um, reasons for that. I, you know, I think that we've mused on over the years. And uh, the first things to say is that Duan is, um, you know, he's someone who you really have to earn his trust, like like anyone. But um, to make this film, uh, you know, I moved to Alice Springs um, for a couple of years, so we were just there with him all the time. We'd known his, we'd known his you know, obviously William and Rachel. Uh, Rachel's even connect, and William are connected through family to to Duan's family. Um, and for me, I'd known his grandmother for many many years and made films alongside her. Um, I actually found a photo of Duan when he was only like four or five out on a camp um, that we'd done like years ago. And I did, I've or even, even forgot that. Um, so yeah, just knowing the family for a long time. While we were filming, Duan would always, he'd only let me interview him when um, he had already interviewed me. So <laughs> he'd have the camera. We would, he you know, taught him how to use the camera and he would, um, you know, do these interviews. And so I've got interviews of me, like talking about what I had for lunch or who my family is or what I was doing that day. Um, so we joke that that's the, the next film that's going to come out, which would be <laughs> way, way less interesting, I have to say. Um, but I think what that speaks to is um, this process that I've, I've really learned from the amazing people around me of ways to... Um, use film as a tool of empowerment and um, how, you know, how in our processes do we um, use storytelling to, you know, give over power and give over space and transfer skills. And I think that is part of the role of a documentary filmmaker. I think that intimacy in film, in documentary in particular, um, you, there's really only two ways to get it. One is that you, you force it and it's really uncomfortable and there's a long history of filmmaking where documentaries have sat in really uncomfortable spaces and been filming when the characters on the screen don't want them filming. Um, and you kind of, you drag it out kicking and screaming. And the other one is that you build an incredible bed of trust with the characters. And in this particular case, with a with the First Nations community, building that trust is, is even tricky here because there's a whole lived experience that our communities you know my community in the north and the communities we worked with in Alice have that tell them you cannot trust people in power you cannot trust people with a camera and so in order to build that trust for us and and children you know young people in particular who often don't have any um, agency or any control over what's being said or what's being told about them or aren't invited into the process whatsoever you know have even less sort of trust and sometimes less awareness of what's happening um, but in in this case um, we started at the very onset by saying in order to build that trust we had to understand that those of us who were at the very beginning film team were not Aranda or Gawa people so we were not people First Nations people from the countries we were filming on even if, even those of us who are First Nations are not from this country. So there are certain things about Duan's experience and his family's experience that we're never going to understand no matter how hard we work. And therefore it became really, really important that we make space for Duan and his family and his trusted elders and community, who one of whom you see on screen today, to have agency in that process. That our, the only way for us to build real trust was to say, we're going to form, we're going to make a partnership with you and give you power over how this story is told old. And Duan, you know, he saw, he understood, we talked about story, he talked about the impact of this film, he saw edits of the film before it happened, and then all along the way, we had this incredible team of advisors, which William was one of the leaders of, um, who helped us as the film team learn what we needed to learn in order to be able to translate, in order to be able to use the technical aspects of filmmaking and artistic aspects of filmmaking in service of the community. Um, you mentioned how much um, like agency uh, Duan uh, had um, uh, during uh, the making of this film, and there's even like one scene where he like actually says, "This movie is about me." Um, so he, he seemed to have like a real um, sense of like what this was and what this what this could be and what his role in it uh, was. Um, I was wondering like how um, how much do you think like beyond the film like it's it's like do you think of, like maybe Maya do you think of the film like as a film as a piece of art maybe or like 
almost like a means to an end, like to get a, the, the story out and maybe to, to move beyond like the medium of film and, um, and like make actual like change. I think for lots of documentary filmmakers, um, well, firstly, I think we're, we're sometimes told that we have to choose one or the other. And certainly films that um, are for change or for impact um, in the film world, at least, uh, kind of denigrated in some ways because they're not sort of works of art or, you know, uh, works of an auteur uh, in that kind of um, film festival world. But I think that what we tried to achieve here is to make something that was incredibly beautiful and evocative and cinematic, but also um, could drive change in the world and hoping that this could be a film to say that we don't have to choose. And certainly that, for me, that's an important thing as a director. Um, before we even started making the film, we were very privileged to have the support of this organisation called Good Pitch, um, which is a Brit Doc initiative. And that means that we were able to raise a budget for our social impact before we'd even financed the actual film, uh, which is very unique. You know, like this never happens in documentary. But it also meant that we could sit down with the families in the film before we'd even picked up a camera and said, um, this is our motivation. Like we want to work with you on a multi-year impact campaign where we can drive the change that you want to see and, and you can... Uh, decide what those goals are. So just in regards to uh, the film, um, if you know the history of uh, First Nations people in Australia, it's been 250 years of decisions being made for you. 250 years where you had to get permission to do anything, uh, where you couldn't go, where you could go, how you spent your money, uh, where you lived, those sort of things. And opportunity uh, to have a say in your life, it's very rare. It, it doesn't come often. And in this case, where the filmmakers allowed the families and the characters to have agency in their lives is really something that set this alight because they realized that they had choice. They could choose the destiny that they wanted. They could choose the road they went down. They knew that they could talk to the uh, filmmakers and say, we, we want to include this, we want to exclude this. And there was a debate and ultimately a consensus around what was in the film, what was not in the film. I think documentaries have always sat in that in-between space of art and social justice. It's, it's leveraging art and leveraging the medium for social justice. And it's a natural marriage because, you know, as Maya and William are talking about, um, the heart of it is that ultimately stories are what draw us together. Stories are what impact us and get our hearts caring about a social justice issue because we can identify with the people we see on screen. We know what it's like to feel what they're feeling, even if we don't know their circumstance, even if we don't understand their world or their worldview. There's certain elements that are common to all of humanity. And if you can get people to care about each other again, and you can get them to see and start to understand that there's an injustice in the world that's the spark for change and art and filmmaking and documentary filmmaking in particular are incredibly useful powerful tools for doing that and what we're seeing now you know I've been making films for 20 years and when I first started making films making a social justice documentary was like a dirty word like you were not allowed to call it a piece of art like the film industry poo-pooed you out of the room you were never allowed to talk on any panels about something that could possibly be a piece of art and a social justice documentary you were you know you you were you were cried down for making propaganda but now what we i think as we've evolved and as we've matured in the space and the, as the industry has matured into a global context and an understanding of how many people are marginalized out of these conversations i think we now know that there is a really powerful in-between space of using the arts for social change and then the platform that was created from the film meant that Duan got an invitation by the Human Rights Commission to go and speak at the Human Rights Council at the United Nations. 
And there he addressed world leaders because the Australian government was not listening about raising the age of criminal responsibility, which is 10 years old in Australia. And the international human rights standard is 14. So you can lock up a 10 year old and there are many children who are incarcerated in Australia. He spoke about education reform and wanting First Nations led education systems in Australia or in Duan's words, he says, I want my school to be run by Aboriginal people, which is a pretty basic thing. Like in Germany, you get to actually when we were in Switzerland in, the, in Geneva, Duan had this like light bulb moment where he was like, oh, everyone's speaking like their language here and it's not <laughs> English. And but that is such a big moment because in Australia or everyone he, he knows who speaks Arunda only speak Arunda at home because they're not allowed to speak it in institutions or at school or anywhere else. So it was like a beautiful moment to witness this like epiphany that in other countries you get taught your language in your school. Um, and then his third thing was um, that he wants a, ha a life um, with culture and language living out on his homelands. And that too is something that in Australia he's not afforded. Um, but pretty sad that he had to go all the way to Geneva to ask for things that seem like, well, that are basic human rights. Um, I was wondering when you made, uh, when did you make the decision to use historical footage to make the film part in, in parts more educational for, for example, for me, it was really um, more than just telling his story, but telling his story, but for a lot of, for a whole culture. Um, that was really interesting to me. And yeah, I was wondering if you knew that right away or while filming or if it was a post-production uh, decision. Um, <clears throat> early on when we were filming, Duan said to me, in an interview, he said, um, Maya, I've got a memory. I've got a memory of, of history in my blood it runs. And that obviously is how we have our title, but it also was very beautiful to me that here you've got this 10 year old child that understands how children and, and every person carry the weight of history on their back and in their blood. And, he a beautiful way that he was describing it as like a memory um and so i think when we sat down with with families and with producers and advisors we're trying to think of how do we give a visual representation of duan's feeling of remembering history and having that walk with him everywhere he goes it's actually still an idea that most governments haven't been able to uh digest is this idea that um the history informs our present and our future. And unless we, rec um, um, we you know, make amends with our history, we can't move forward. Um, but yeah, that's sort of where it came from. But also you'll see like in the film, there are these like flickers of historical footage. Not, not, it's not informational. You don't know exactly what all of those events are as Duan probably doesn't know what a lot of those events are. He would know some of those events, but it's a feeling that walks with you um, and it's moments of resilience and strength and it's the history that's not told, uh, but the history that lives within, within people. What was the feedback you got like, maybe from, from Australia, uh, both from uh, people who saw themselves uh, self, uh, reflected on screen and also maybe people who were um, like forced to like reckon with the um, crimes of colonization that yeah have happened and are still happening i know that um i would not be um sitting here talking to you today if that was that option was afforded my family you know i'd be probably talking fluent ironda somewhere off in, off in the distance somewhere uh, but I'm not. And um, one of the things is that I could see the dialectic of what was happening there with Duan, and I wish that had happened to me. Um, I'm 67 now, and I still struggle with that identity. I still struggle with that. And it eats, you, eats at you, it burns at you, 
you know, you, at, ultimately at the end of the day, um, you've got to deal with that. But in regards to um, the audience, it was never um, targeted to be that, but it's one of the outcomes, one of the um, stories that came out of this. And a lot of Aboriginal people uh, who I have seen um, who watched the film said, that's the truth. At last, the truth is being told. And that's a, a side effect that uh, in regard to the First Nations people here and when they've seen the film. And, and it's one of the things that's probably resonating with you now is that you can see that the injustices can lead to uh, a whole heap of uh, angst and anxiety in families and breaking up families. Um, but in this case, I'm glad that the family had choice and were able to have agency and were able to make decisions and, and they took that and they ran with it. I think the other audience, which um, fits probably under the non-First Nations audience, but is um, educators and teachers um, yes, across the yes. world has been, we've had an incredible response and really beautiful heartfelt um, feedback from teachers who um, are really hungry for the support in their classrooms to be culturally safe, to um, be able to support their First Nations children um, in their classrooms to, um, to learn um, in an appropriate way, but that they've watched the film and, you know, maybe being able to see things that they haven't before because they've had the opportunity to sit in Duan's perspective and see the world from his um, eyes. Um, and the last audience, which I suppose is really relevant for this audience, is children themselves. And mm -hmm. it's so beautiful that, like, you can watch, I mean, Duan does most of the work because he's so charismatic and, and funny and, and smart, but his voice just sort of gets into you. And so I think for children across the world, Duan is, uh, is very inspiring. Yeah, also uh, saw a real, like, hunger from Duan to, like, to take that responsibility from his um, uh, parents and grandparents um, and to uh, carry on that culture. Whereas, like, um, like, like here for us, this seems often to be like a disconnect between the uh, generations. And and Duan's family, it seems to be really like, um, like the um, he was he asked a lot of questions. Um, he asked his grandparents a lot of questions uh, um, about their childhood, and um, and he seemed to be really like uh, interested to 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 um, have that connection and to not to not. Um, like rebel against uh, against his own culture, but against uh, the systems that, uh, that 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 oppress them. So um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. He, um, it was not just like about different cultures, but uh, but all, also like about the different uh, generations. The disconnect between the elders and children is really interesting um, that you point that out because it is the case in most First Nations communities, even though there is still a disconnect sometimes between First Nations children and, and their elders, because the cultures, and this is something that seems to resonate in most countries, most First Nations countries I've been in across the world, um, all over the place, that there is still a, an incredibly strong bond between elders and children. And it's one of the most beautiful things about coming from a First Nations community is being raised with that. Um, Megan, Duan's mom, said, you know, I want audiences to know that we Aboriginal parents love and care about our kids. And it's a very basic um, message in some ways. It's simple. But um, I think that it's still a radical idea, certainly in Australia, and which is incredibly unfortunate. But we hope that when audiences and when you watch the film, you can see how much care and love, you know, Duane's whole family, elders, parents, um, aunties, uncles have for their children. And if we could all believe that, then um, so many of the issues and around policy and government that affect Aboriginal people could be um, improved. Yes, thank okay. you. Are we out of time? Or? I think if you have another question, 
you could ask, but... I, I think it's a good, it's a good it way to end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing that I, yeah. I would really like to say is that um, if people have been moved by the film, if you've, there's young kids that have watched the film and want to learn more about Duan or learn more how to support his family, you can go to our website at um, inmybloodatruns.com um, take act, slash take action um, and you can learn about a whole lot of ways that you can support um, whether it's helping to build an Aranda led school on Duan's homeland which is something that we're trying to do um, or sign a petition about First Nations led education or raising the age of criminal responsibility in Australia um, or just learning more about how to um, confront your own bias and, um, and racism um, there's heaps of amazing resources there um, and also just thank you so much for the, your beautiful questions tonight. Thank, thank you, you so much for, you for answering them. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was very enlightening. Um, I'd, li I'd like to thank you for the opportunity uh, to be able to speak to you tonight. Um, I think uh, the movement around the world is people are raising their voice and this is just one way of doing it. And um, I want to thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you and good luck with your project. Thank you. Yeah. And good luck with your film festival and anything <laughs> else that's, um, that's happening in, you know, these strange, weird COVID times. I hope you're yes. all safe yes. and take care. Yeah. Rachel. Thanks so much for having us and thanks to your audiences for watching the film. And, you know, we'd love to hear back from you and get to you if you want to come and join us. Please do. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, and I reckon it's dinner time for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay then. Enjoy your dinner. Yeah, okay. Thanks again. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. bye. <laughs> bye. Okay, und euch vielen Dank fürs Einschalten. Danke auch nochmal an das Mock, dass wir hier wieder sein durften im Studio. Und schaut euch gerne noch den Rest vom Programm an. Es gibt auf jeden Fall noch viele weitere spannende Filme. Die Filme könnt ihr im Kino, im DFF in Frankfurt sehen, aber auch im Caligari in Wiesbaden. Und auch fast den kompletten Wettbewerb könnt ihr auch online sehen. Noch bis zum 1.10. läuft Lukas und am 2. und 4.10. gibt es die Wettbewerbsgewinner im Kino, im DFF. Ansonsten schaut auch gerne bei unseren Social Media Kanälen vorbei. Es gibt ein paar coole Challenges, wo ihr Filmtickets gewinnen könnt. Und sagt gerne auch euren Lehrerinnen, Lehrerinnen und Lehrern Bescheid, weil es auch coole Angebote für Schulklassen gibt. Ähm, danke nochmal an euch beide, dass ihr hier wart und auch an das Lukas-Team hinter den Kulissen. Und dann sehen wir uns hoffentlich nächstes Jahr wieder im Kino.